Hello, everyone. Welcome to Follow Your Bliss, How Taking the Road Less Travel Can Lead to Your Best Life. I'm Lisa Martin with Silver Spring Town Center, and we're so happy to have all of you here, along with our host, Maurice Philogene, and our amazing panel. We have such a diverse array of talented, creative folks who are going to share their story of taking the road less traveled. Before we get started, I wanted to tell you a couple things about SSTCI. We are celebrating Silver Spring Blues Week. We are still virtual through the summer, though. Uh, even though it was just announced, the Civic Building is now letting things happen. So we have an awesome Silver Spring Blues Week planned, uh, including blues through poetry. We have a blues movie night, blues comedy, and a couple performances, uh, as well as some other events, special lecture event. We will have that on um, the week of Monday, June 14th through June 19th. So please join us for all those amazing uh, programs all at 8 p.m. Um, and all of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts and many others. Um, this, this program I'm so excited about. I actually, it occurred to me maybe a year and a half ago, my friend and fellow classmate from Leadership Montgomery, Maurice Philogene, who's hosting tonight's program, was in the on the island of Suomalina in Helsinki in the middle of winter. And I've been there a few times, having served in the Peace Corps in Estonia. And he he occasionally posts a he, he's a major globe trotter and posts his thoughts on life. And I I said, hey Maurice, you're going to have to facilitate a discussion on how to live your best life, taking the road less traveled. And then we finally decided to put it together this year in between his busy schedule with Quattro Capital and doing real estate all over the country and world. And um, he also lives part-time in the Mediterranean. So he's just in from, from uh, Lebanon, I believe. He just flew in last night. Um, and, some other folks we have on the panel, they're going to each introduce you, but we have um, three people from the SSTCI family, including Dr. Cheryl Brissett Chapman, who's, who was on my hiring committee. She's on our advisory board. She was a founding board member of SSTCI. She's a major mentor to me all these years. She really rocks. And she's the, she's the head of the National Center for Children and Families, huge advocate for children. And, and social, she's a major social worker. One, my cousin here in San Diego just got her master's in social work. And I know she's tuning in, to, especially to see Sh Cheryl. That's, um, that's Sarah West on the call. Um, and we also have David Fogel, who is SSTCI president. He owns Bump and Grind and a new coffee roaster is part of that. Uh, but he's done so many other things in the arts, including the DC Forward Festival, and was a founding board member of SSTCI as well. We also have a current board member of SSTCI, Joy Carr, and she is really awesome. She's a uh, head of talent acquisition for United Therapeutics. So she's an HR person, but United Therapeutics is such a creative and forward thinking place that, um, you know, we have so much to learn from how they do things. And she's, she's just a great asset to our board. Um, coming in from Singapore, we have Chef Kaimana Chi. And he, I know him through the Hawaiian group, Han 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 how do I pronounce it? Hello, no Hona Hawaii. Hello, hello to Hawaii. Yes, they're awesome performance group, but he's also, he's doing amazing things as an international chef and he's got his uncle, um, his, sorry, I heard, <laughs> un uncle's, what's the name of your restaurant in uncle's Maryland? Hawaii, uncle's Hawaiian Grinds. Yeah, we'll you're, you're gonna tell us about that because I've been waiting for Hawaiian food in the DC area since I moved 
moved to DC in 1999. I'm from California where we have, where we love Hawaiian food. We also have um, Katie Gone, who is an awesome drum circle leader. She followed her bliss and makes a living leading people in drumming. And she's awesome. She does drum circles for us. She's done so many for us virtually and in person at our festivals. Um, and she's going to tell you more about her life. My friend Ariana, Ariana Ross, who is the executive director of Story Tapestries, awesome storyteller, awesome person all the way around. She'll tell you more. We have Rhett Power, international author. He's a toy entrepreneur. He's a public, you know, he's an international speaker and a fellow Return Peace Corps volunteer. We met at the National Peace Corps Association's conference a few years ago. And um, I am I, uh, Ramton Arablue. He is the, the producer and composer uh, for NPR's Throughline. And I just met him recently through a good friend of mine, his son-in-law, my friend Fausto Bayonet. And when I met him and heard about what he does, I said, you've got to be on this panel discussion. And they're gonna tell you more about what they do. Did I miss anyone? We are still waiting for Philippa Hughes to come, but I think I gave a brief intro of, of all of our panelists that are here. And now let's get started with the program. I will turn it over to Maurice. Take it away, Maurice. Wow, what is up? How is everybody? Happy Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday. It is. I'm getting confused with my time zones. But thank you, Lisa. My name is Maurice Philogene. I am a proud resident, somewhat part-time resident now, but I've been in Montgomery County since 2010. And Lisa and I got connected through Leadership Montgomery. Um, I am home today, so that makes me happy. Um, we are here to talk about following your bliss. In other words, how to live your, your best life now. In other words, how to not get stuck in the matrix. In other words, do what matters for you, not what society tells you to do. I think one of the reasons we're having this particular discussion is because uh, Lisa and I have talked quite a bit on the topic and she recognized that I was doing some very unique things out in the world. And I love to talk about those things because I'm encouraging people to live life their way is important. There's no blueprint, there's just your print. Um, one of the best ways we can do that is by having examples of folks and we have some awesome examples of people today. Um, so we're gonna get into that. That is the purpose why we are here, to so talk about how you can follow your bliss and just share ideas, that's it, and listen. Um, from an agenda perspective, we are here for 90 minutes till about 8.30, I'm gonna try and keep it to that. Where we're gonna hit the, we're, our, I've already hit the purpose of why we're here, each of the panelists are gonna get about four minutes to talk through who they are, what they have engaged on in life and where they are in their particular journey on their um, following their bliss mentality. Um, and then I have some questions for each of the panelists, but I'd actually like questions from you guys. This is all about y'all. This is not for us to just get up here and speak. This is for us to answer questions that can benefit the entire group. So if you have questions, there's a little chat button right down there somewhere. Yep. Use the chat, throw it up in there, and I will get to it. And we'll have panelists um, answer those. I'll ask the panelists to stick to just a minute or two in response so we can have a diverse conversation. Um, the intent is to get into a conversation. The intent is not to just hear us speak. So the more you are engaged through the questions, the better this uh, session will be. Um, from a logistical perspective, again, we're going to try and go till 8.30. What I'd ask is that if you have something you'd like to ask, please put it in the chat. I may call on you to speak out um, on the Zoom itself, but given the amount of people we have, that's going to be a bit challenging. So bear with me. And if I um, chime in, that's just because I'm trying to keep the conversation moving. Is that fair? Is that cool, Lisa? Right on. All right. So I get the benefit of talking a little bit about my particular journey. I'm even gonna put myself on a timer because we're gonna keep this joint flowing. Uh, I am an entrepreneur, a senior executive, a police officer, a retired federal agent. 
I founded a real estate investment firm and a bunch of other things, but none of that matters. What matters is my number one way that I articulate who I am is that I'm a freedom fighter for myself. I never liked the idea that I was going to follow the path, high school, college, get out into the real world, get too much debt, have too many car payments and have be stuck going to work. I wanted to do things my way, a different way. So I am very principled on certain free, what I call freedom principles, financial freedom, time freedom, geographic freedom, freedom of purpose and freedom of relationships. And I stick to those things and that's where I focus my time. Historically, from a work perspective, I graduated from University of Virginia in, uh, in Charlottesville, born in New York, raised in Boston, came to DC by University of Virginia and immediately got hired by a consulting firm called Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture. 24 years I've been at that company. I'm still there as a senior executive. I also was a military officer right out of college. I just retired as Lieutenant Colonel in late 2019 from the United States Air Force as a federal agent. So think NCIS or the FBI, but the Air Force's version of it. When I deployed overseas, I loved being part of, part of and helping community so much that I wanted to get connected to my local community, that being Montgomery County. And I joined the Montgomery County Police Department and did full-time careers everywhere because I wanted it that bad. I just created time. I'm still a police officer to this day, although I just put in my retirement papers after almost 15 years. It's my time to move on. And then I'm very much so an entrepreneur and have the entrepreneurial spirit. I've been involved in real estate investing since I was 21. That allowed me to earn my financial freedom by 2014, having way more passive income than I do expenses. Um, and now I started a real estate investment firm called Quattro Capital. We buy uh, uh, apartment complexes across the US and help folks invest their funds for greater than average returns, but more so to give back to community. One of the things I love that we do is giving or working with housing authorities and nonprofit organizations to get, for example, 30 to 50% of the entire complex uh, housed by homeless or those affected by homelessness. That's our way of giving back to community. So that's me in a very rounded shell. I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. I did miss something. My biggest passion is travel and Lisa alluded to that. Um, I don't travel for the purpose of being a tourist. I travel for the purpose of integrating into community and learning about the world. It's really important to me. I'm, I'm upwards of 100 countries now over 250 times. And rather than hang out in the city and waste money and things of that nature, I tend to get on a plane and go, go explore the world. Um, that's my bliss. I know that seems like a lot, but I create time to do all those things because I want to live uniquely my way. And it's very important for me to do that. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, let's go to Mr. David Fogel to talk about how he has gone on his own road to bliss. Hey everybody, David Fogel here. Uh, Maurice, thanks so much uh, for hosting. Lisa, thanks for uh, inviting me to be a part of this. Um, I am a Monk Moco native. Um, I'm gonna follow the time here as well, set a timer. Um, I guess a little bit about my journey. Uh, I never allowed myself or ended up being pigeonholed in, in anything. Growing up as a kid, I was a jock, a musician, a academic and then a theater student. Um, I, uh, in college, I, uh, it was a lot of money and uh, I was looking at all of the major options and I was like, you know, some of those classes didn't really appeal to me. And I was like, why am I gonna take classes I don't want to? So I designed my own major. Um, I ended up double majoring and in uh, community development and Asian studies. And I remember a senior year in college getting ready graduate and listening to a bunch of my friends um, talking about uh, the jobs they were going to take and how they were going to suck it up for a few years and and then they were going to make a lot of money and live the life that they really wanted to live and I was like wait a minute um, so I decided that I was going to go to Japan in uh, Japan I ended up studying an artist cooperative Hey David, you're a little bit you're a little bit muffled. 
Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I've got my headphone on. Uh, I'm not sure what else I can do. There it is. It's back now. Okay. Okay. Cool. If you move the headphone, it might make sure. Keep it still. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, I was in Japan, um, started a bunch of projects there, um, an environmental festival, uh, English summer camp for junior high school students. Uh, community rec center and an artist cooperative, one of the first ones on the northern island of, of Hokkaido. Um, and then I came home uh, back here to uh, Bethesda and Silver Spring. Um, I led the Montgomery County chapter of an interjurisdictional community development corporation where I managed the arts and entertainment district here in Silver Spring. I started Silver Springs first art gallery. This was a little while ago now, um, an art walk series. And um, I started hosting uh, multimedia events, which uh, became something I was really interested in during my time in Japan and ended up uh, running and curating a festival in um, DC for 10 years. Um, it was five days called Forward. Um, all of this kind of came together uh, about seven years ago. My, my passions around community, uh, my passions around music, um, and uh, it manifested itself in uh, my coffee record shop called Bump and Grind um, here in Silver Spring. And um, we are, as Lisa noted, opening up a, a new place in uh, the Silver Spring Library soon here in a couple weeks. And uh, we've opened up a new coffee roastery uh, almost a year ago. And we also have a record label. So um, that's me. Really excited to be here um, and uh, participate. Thank you, Maurice. That is awesome, David. First gallery in Silver Spring. I'm loving that. Um, Miss Katie, if you wouldn't mind jumping on and talking to us about your journey and where you are. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lisa. It's really great to be here. And um, if you have your video on right now, I want you to make a silly movement in the camera if you have ever been to a drum circle before. Okay. Awesome. Make another silly movement on the camera if you have drummed virtually on Zoom. Aha! All right, that's cool. That's cool. And make a sound. Make a make a movement if you know what a drum circle facilitator is. Okay, perfect. Well, I am a drum circle facilitator. Um, I have a. a organization called Drumming for Wellness, and I drum with all populations in the DC area. I've been doing this for 15 years, and I think that um, I have gotten here because I've just really followed the beat of my heart. So I grew up in Syracuse, New York. I came down to DC to go to school to study communications. My senior year in college, I I just discovered drumming and it just totally took me on a path that I could never have ever imagined. So I started out being a percussionist and then I was going to community drum circles. And a lot of us think of community drum circles as maybe hippie thunder drumming type experiences, right? At festivals or things like that. And that's definitely where I got my start, but it has definitely evolved from that. And now we drum in all settings, in hospitals, in hospice, in occupational therapy, in assisted living, in rehab, in prisons, churches, community celebrations, um, kids, special needs, seniors, all populations. So after I was drumming in these circles, I had the opportunity to actually see a drum circle facilitated. And it was one of those aha moments of like, this is what I want to do. Make a, make a motion if you've had that moment in your life. Aha, this is what I want to do. Yeah, right. So I started doing it and I got really great feedback right away because I would do drum circles and I heard people say, wow, you were born to do this. And I listened to that and I was like, okay, all right, well, maybe I should keep doing this. So it was just one step in front of the other and just, just staying at it. And I have a real passion for community. 
So I've just always made sure that I was providing my services to the community because drumming, drumming circles are all about community. And this has just led me to so many connections in this area, including Lisa and Silver Spring Town Center. So it's, it's been a joy, but my mother taught me to be very practical and pragmatic. So I've also always had a job. <laughs> so I do drumming for wellness and I do jobs. And thank God for that, because last year when the pandemic hit, guess what? Everything got canceled. Everything. And at first, the drum circle world was like, what? What are we going to do? And a lot of people just, just had to stop. And a lot of people decided to jump online and do virtual drum circles. So that is a thing now. And we, we do that, don't we, Lisa? And, you know, we've had people join us from all over the world for our drum circles. Uh, but I was also, I was really glad to have a job. So I've always had uh, part-time work. And I usually do that with working through um, organizations that I still fulfills my mission, which is to be in community and to offer connections. So I've been very fortunate to also work with a nonprofit located in D.C. called Shalem Institute, and we offer programs in contemplative spirituality. So I've been very fortunate that all my passions have supported one another and it has allowed me to continue to grow. I had another amazing experience where I learned that if you just share what you do, you never know who's watching. So my teacher, Arthur Hall, who's known for the godfather of the drum circle movement all over the world and has trained thousands of people all over the planet to do this work, he was quietly watching me as I posted on Facebook, and then he invited me to be one of his global trainers. So now I am continuing his work as I train the future generation of drum circle facilitators. And that could be you. So you never know who's watching. Share your bliss. Thank you. That's awesome, Katie. And what I loved about you said what I loved about what you said was um, that the drum the drum circle was a passion, and that you kept your work because you needed to. But that's exactly what we're talking about: is the passion stuff. What makes you happy? What what allows us to live is one thing, but what makes us happy is a total another thing. Um, so let's go on to Miss Ariana Ross, if you are with us. Hello, hello. Hey. You know, it's interesting listening to everybody because as I listen, I started thinking about, you know, where I started. So for me, um, I always tell people when I was in high school, my mother told me three things. Don't be an artist. I'm an artist. Do not, do not, do not, Ariana, please do not travel the world as much as I did and do all the dangerous things that I did as a child. I did all of them. And then she said to me, don't necessarily choose the path of not-for-profit because you won't make money. And I did. So I always joke that all the things my mother told me not to do, I did. And that's how I found my bliss. Um, and she jokes. She, she looks at me and goes, oh. but the truth of the matter is um, I got itchy feet when I was 11 years old. Um, there's an organization that still exists called Children's International Summer Villages. Um, and when I was 11 years old, I had an opportunity to go to Mexico through that organization. And that really developed my love of traveling. Traveling is just kind of a part of who I am. Um, Maurice, when you spoke in the beginning, I'm similar. I don't go and be a tourist. I go and I sit somewhere. I connect with communities. I support in whatever way I can. All of my experiences have been in places that no one ever expected to go with. Um, I joke, I met my husband. Um, I went to Brazil to study capoeira with my teacher and I met him. He thought I was a crazy American that he was like, who is this woman? Because I showed up in Brazil with a 52 pound bag of clothes. Now I travel like this. I traveled with 10 pounds of clothes. The 52 pounds were not me. My friend asked me, she worked in community in Brazil and was like, hey, the kids in my neighborhood do not have a sufficient access to clothes. I know you travel with like this, but you're allowed two 52 pound bags of suitcases. Could you bring all of your empty, like anything that you're not utilizing, could you bring clothes? So I was like, sure, why not? So I literally bought a um, scale two days before I was to travel and I packed up to 104 pounds of clothes for my friend. And I probably had about 10 pounds worth. And that is how I met my husband. He was like, who is this crazy lady who can't even pick up her suitcase? 
Um, and when we were in Brazil, we just became best friends. We actually, I told him, I don't, I don't date people when I travel. This is a bad idea. Um, just so you, everyone is aware, we've been married 13 years. He's my longest summer fling because that's what he was going to be. We were just going to date each other for fun. Um, but in the process of actually living in Brazil and living in Southeast Asia, I lived in India for three years. I really discovered in some ways my bliss and my bliss comes from the power of helping people or the gift of helping people find their voice and tell their story. And that's where Story Tapestries comes from. Um, we're 10 years old now. I never imagined, not in my wildest dreams, that I would be an executive director. That is not was not my intention. My path was I was gonna be a theater director on Broadway. Um, I tried that world. I honestly, no offense to anyone who does that world. I hated it. Um, I am not a, I'm not a person who likes to stay up late at night, um, rub shoulders with certain people, drink to all hours, because that's what was required in that theater. I see some, Janelle is nodding her head. I just, it wasn't my style. The minute I got in front of children, and Lisa mentioned I'm a storyteller. The minute I got in front of children and I had the opportunity to perform and direct shows for kids, I was like, whoa, this is it. Um, today, uh, Story Tapestry sent me to an early childhood center and uh, we've had the amazing opportunity during COVID to give these kids every single month um, an art and literacy kit. And now coming up in June, we're going to get to work with them to provide drama and storytelling and to listen to the kids. They didn't, they never met me in person. This is the first time. And they were like, you're the art lady. Oh my goodness. So literally Katie, I was like, ooh, drums. How can we get drums in there, right? Um, so I feel like my everyday is bliss. I get to like wake up in the morning and work with children and adults and help them find their story. And I have two amazing kids who are annoyed that I've locked them out of my office to be on this panel today. <laughs> because otherwise they'd be crawling on my lap. Um, but they're also my bliss. So. Thank you, Anna. I'm gonna send my 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 kids to you because they love love story storytelling, but in unique ways. I have a feeling you, you're stupendous at it. Um, speaking of stories, I know he gets into a lot of them, so I'm gonna turn over to Ramtin. If Ramtin, you are there and available, I'm here. Man. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. All right, you hear me? Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, uh, I'm Ramtin. I'm the uh, co-host and producer of uh, NPR show Throughline. We're on WAMU on Sundays at 4 p.m. Uh, I think NPR is requiring me to make that um, plug. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, actually had a, I've had like a kind of roller coaster uh, adult life and career. Um, I spent um, much of my early 20s working as a community organizer. I'm also originally from uh, Montgomery County. I went to a high school in Germantown and I've lived in Gaithersburg and Rockville and Rockville is where I live now. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, I worked as an organizer um, in working on environmental justice issues. And the truth is like that whole time I was doing that, what I wanted to do was be a musician. It's been the thing I've wanted to do since I was a kid. And I, I come from, a, I'm from an Iranian family, a traditional one. So for us, you know, the only real two options in terms of career was to either be a doctor or a lawyer or pursue something like that. Because, you know, for, as immigrants, and I'm an immigrant myself, the goal of coming to this country was to make kind of a successful life for yourself, um, to make money and have a comfortable life. Um, I didn't go that route. Uh, I ended up working in organizing and then eventually I decided, hey, you know what, I want to do music. That's the thing I'm most passionate about. And I decided to take a plunge. I quit my job. Um, I decided to basically do music full time. And in 2012, I got a bit of a lucky break. I was playing a concert at a local venue called Black Cat, which I'm sure many of you been to, have been to. Um, and NPR's Bob Boylan came to that concert to see another band and saw the band I was in. And really liked us and then featured us on his show called um, All Songs Considered. And uh, we got a big break, you know, we got an agent um, started and I started doing composing and music full time from there. Um, I started doing music and sound design for films. Um, we did the trailer music for a movie called 300 Rise of an Empire, which was a big IMAX film, kind of blockbuster film. 
Um, and then I had a sort of real, I was living in Silver Spring at the time working and um, I had an, I accidentally basically got um, an opportunity to work with Guy Raz from NPR on his show, Ted Ready Hour, to write live music for um, the Ted Ready Hour live show, which is something they were experimenting with at the time. That really went well. Um, we did it, it ended. And at the end of it, Guy told me, hey, I'm going to work with you. We're going to do something together at some point. So anyway, I didn't think much of it. Six months later, he calls me and he's like, I want you to come work on a pilot for a show, a podcast that I'm making at NPR. And I said, well, I've never done journalism. Like, what am I supposed to do? He said, don't worry about it. Come here and we'll, I'll teach you how to do it. It's easy. It's not rocket science. So I went in um, and I was a three-week contract to work on a pilot for a show. I would write music for it and I would produce it. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I had to like look it up on Google, like how to write interview questions. Um, it was really hard, um, but that three-week contract became three months, six months, a year. The show came out, was a big hit. Um, it was called How I Built This, which is this big entrepreneurial show. And then from there, uh, I, I started a new career working in journalism and podcasting. It was almost six years ago. And then I, you know, I met my current co-host and partner on the show, Rand Abdel Fattah, and we came up with an idea for a history podcast that would explore histories of current events that aren't often told. And uh, it's, an, it's an art project. It's an art show about history, basically, when we employ a lot of music and sound design and all that stuff. So we basically took a chance and came up with an idea for a show, and NPR eventually um, supported us. And we launched a show, and it came out at number one on the Apple charts and became a huge success. And now it's on over 100 stations in the U.S. and growing. We've only been a radio show for a few months. Um, and it started a whole new career for me as a musician, as a composer. Now I've written music for 15 different shows that have been number one on the Apple charts and podcasting. I've scored documentaries and films. And um, basically the thing that I least expected to happen when I was in my you know, mid to late 20s ended up happening for me. And it all happened kind of accidentally. So when I ask, when I speak to students in particular, I tell them that um, the only way you'll be good at anything is if you do something you truly enjoy. And I think that translates to following your bliss. So I've gotten a chance to do that and only came because I was persistent and I never really gave up on it, despite the fact that everything in my life was telling me to give up and to go kind of a more traditional route. So anyway, I'm happy to be with so many other people here that have also done that. I've actually gone to many of your businesses, the folks here that have businesses or participate in the things you've done. So I'm really excited to be here. I'm a DC area person through and through. So uh, thanks for having me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that people awesome. have. Awesome, Ramton. And you know what? Uh, I just want to highlight something you said for the crew. You said you didn't know exactly what you were doing when you were asked that, and you used Google and I think something else. You just kind of figured it out along the way. That's, That's called right. finding something you love to do and course correcting, just going after it. Course correcting is a phrase that I love. I am wondering if Miss Cheryl Chapman has uh some feedback and can tell us a little bit about her journey if cheryl is there oh i'm here hi oh, yes hi ma'am i'm here and now i know why i love david fogel so much because i fell in love with him when i first met him because we have some vibes here okay david and your beautiful child uh, so look at uh, my bliss thing and i'm not going to go through my journey really because we don't have that kind of time, and I got three and a half minutes left. So I'm going to tell you, my first thing has been the black girl in pursuit of identity. I mean, my thing has been, my mama told me when I was little, that as long as you have me and God, you got it. You fear no one. So you can pursue your thing, and your voice is important. And even if they tell me to shut you up, I want to hear your voice. So here's this little black girl coming, the great black migration. I am 71. You all are my children's age. And so as we go up the great migration in 49, I'm sitting on my mama's lap, my brother's on my other lap, her other lap. She's 19, we're going north to pursue her husband who went ahead of her because he couldn't get a job coming off the Navy. Jim Crow is where I evolved from. And I'm an East Coast girl, so we came up north to Boston and now I'm the black girl. Every time I turn around, I was the black girl. The Jewish boys want to know why the black girl got the answer. The Irish teacher says, send her to girls Latin school because she does have a strong math aptitude. At girls Latin school, I find out 
that these kids are going to this place called Brown or Pembroke. Where is that? But I got a boyfriend at Harvard, so I can go to Providence and go see him and not go home. So that's why I went to Brown. Get there. There's eight black girls in the whole school. We're each in the dorm. And I'm saying, here we go, the black girl. And this whole idea of who am I in the midst of this journey, because the northern black folk didn't act like the southern black folk. Now I'm in the white girls' school in a white boy university. Who am I? Helped organize the 1968 black walkout. And now I get an honorary doctorate two years ago from Brown because I'm an icon. And all I did was read. Ralph Ellison's book that said, we are only there when we're not there. They won't talk about us till we disappear. So we walked down to this church, disappeared. New York Times said, uh, uh, why did the black students walk out? Well, actually, only two thirds of us walked out, led by the women. But why did they walk out? I said, because we can take it anymore. New York Times, everyone freaked out. The, the, the business men's kids. This is a school no one ever heard of. Who is Brown? Brown appointed its first Ivy League woman of color, anyone of color, was at Brown. 50 years later, I bring back 800 as co-chair of the reunion. I bring them back. So I'm the black girl. My bliss is following my instinct to discover who I am in the context of a very rejecting, biased, uninformed, ignorant context. All right, and I need to discover, okay, so how am I being seen here? Because I'm black, I'm female, and I'm smart. God, why did you do that to me? Two out of three would have worked, but not all three. Not all three, the black girls. So my bliss has been exploring. I've been around the world. I was hearing you all. You know, I've hung out. I've got sisters I've discovered with the Lakotas and the Dakotas. I have done the CPS system in Guam in the Pacific Basin of the U.S. Department of Public Health for years. I have this, so I have a Cypernese family. I'm married to a Senegalese. I have a home in Senegal, so I live in both here and I live in Senegal. And I live in both cultures, Christian and Muslim. Okay? I like the diversity and pursuit of identity. You see who you are when you're in the context of understanding differences. And you see who you are when you care about how people see you instead of being concerned about how you see them and judge them and evaluate them and direct them and boss them, because nobody can be really boss. I'm influenced by that. Uh, my bliss, my bliss, some of the last things I want to share, because I could go on, being the first black probation officer at 21 in Rhode Island with 50 girls on any city probation, and, and having the police officer try to pick me up in the courtroom because he didn't know I was a court officer being the first black woman to really drive Peter Edelman's deinstitutionalization of kids in New York City during the 70s and having to deal with black men and men who didn't believe that I was a leader and they had to protect me. No, you can't protect me. You're gonna get me hurt with these boys that are very angry. Um, looking at some other first black experiences, I mean, when I went to Brown, Ira Magazine uh, and his crew destroyed the curriculum and we had an open curriculum. I'm a product of that. You make up your degrees, Dave. That's why now I understand why I'm attracted to you. Made up my degree. I started off pre-med science degree, candidate, only black girl, only black girl. And ended up theater, English, sociology, political science, psychology, and I made up my degree, which led me to this preoccupation about how do we develop institutions that mediate the destructive impact of poverty and racism and sexism. Uh, my exposure to feminists in New York, radical feminists. My exposure to folks who were civil rights organizers. My exposure to people in France, in Beijing, with the Chinese summit of social workers. Um, I'm just gonna begin to just end with this. What's bliss? Bliss is that I am married to a man who looks nothing like me on the outside, but we are the same on the inside. And we enjoy experiencing new places and new things. And I enjoy having that and role modeling that for my children and for my grandchildren. It's about enjoying this journey. It's the only journey that you can be guaranteed that you will have. Yes, ma'am. And it's the only journey we have is to be on this life and do exactly what we want to do and have as many experiences as possible. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. We appreciate that. Kaimana. 
Brother, I know you've been sitting patiently. Hope everything is okay over there. Awesome. Uh, aloha, everybody. My name is Kaimana Chi. I am originally from the North Shore of Oahu in Hawaii, uh, but I've been a resident of the DMV since 2004. Um, and yeah, here's my here's my little journey. Uh, I never planned on becoming on becoming a chef, but uh, growing up in Hawaii, I'm the oldest of nine children. And when my parents had me, they were 14 and 15, still in high school. Uh, so you can imagine that at that time uh, in the 70s. Uh, both of my grandfathers were uh, religious leaders. It was big controversy in my hometown, but I think I was lucky enough to be born into a very, very loving family and a huge one. Uh, and I, I developed a passion for both food and music really, really early in my life because all of my uncles and aunts, my grandparents were all musicians and singers and food is absolutely the touchstone of, of Hawaiian and Polynesian cultures. So I grew up with that. But back in those days, uh, being a chef wasn't what it meant to, like it is today, right? It, 25 years ago, you couldn't name 10 or 15 chefs. Now today, uh, the average person can, can name several. So uh, after high school, I left. I went to college in Idaho because uh, it, was, it was free and the first college to offer me a scholarship. And of course, with nine kids, my parents were like, if it's free, it's for you. So you go. Uh, very, very monochromatic place in the world, coming from one of the most diverse states uh, in the world or in the, in the country. Uh, came back home in 2000 and really started my career in customer service and hospitality, tourism being the number one, um, the number one sector sort of in Hawaii. Uh, I lost my sister and my best friend in 2003, which prompted me to move to the East Coast and I got a job as a, as a flight attendant uh, for a contracted airlines with a DOD, which really started my travel journey around the world. And it was just a way for me to see the world and, um, and experience culture. In high school, I was an exchange student uh, in Czechoslovakia. So a Hawaiian in Czechoslovakia was pretty unique, uh, but I think that experience set my eyes uh, and my passion really set out that I was going to see the world someday, uh, no, matter, no matter what the catalyst would be. Um, Fast forward, again, food was always my passion and so was music, but again, I, I never thought of them as ways to make a living. So uh, what happened in 2005, I left the travel industry and got a regular office job for a nonprofit in DC called the Academy for Educational Development. Uh, started right there at the bottom and on the side, I would cook for friends and do things like that. Uh, in 2011, I auditioned for my first reality TV show called Master Chef. And um, a long story short, from there, uh, I started teaching cooking classes in DC. Uh, later, I got on the Food Network a few times. I was working as a director of IT training and continual service improvement for several nonprofit organizations. Um, and then in 2016, uh, I finally made the jump. I was offered this amazing opportunity to be a chef ambassador for a global food company, which is why I'm here in Singapore. Um, I also got offered my own restaurant, which is north of Baltimore in Falston, everybody visit, called Uncle's Hawaiian Grinds. Uh, and that's brought me here right now in uh, Singapore. I am launching the world's first commercially approved cultured meat. Uh, you can check it out at goodmeat.co. Um, but just making the world a better place. And as an ambassador of food and music, it's one of those, um, my time is up, but food and music are one of the things that transcends the bounds of culture and geography. And I get the privilege of being an ambassador of food, which has taken me around the world. So thank you. Kaimana, I love that. Uh, I have nowhere near your chops on the food space. Um, but I respect it. I've been investing in restaurants in DC for a long time. And every time I walk into those kitchens, now I understand the true value of chefs, people that do what you do. It is a passion of love and creativity, man. So big respect and congratulations on your success. Um, Mr. Rhett Power, if you are there, sir, 
I know you've been waiting for and your 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 Red, come off mute one more time. Yeah, it's still happening. Yep, it's still happening. Can you can, uh, log off and come back in? You, are you logged on by phone as well, Red? If you are logged on by phone, you need to mute uh, one of your devices. That's why. All right, so while well, Red solves that, Red, I would log off on any device you're on and come back in. But while Rhett solves that, let's go over to Ms. Joy Carr. Hello. Hey, Joy. How are you all? It's been great to hear everyone's stories. Um, I think I was destined for bliss just because my name is Joy. <laughs> my parents have different versions of why my name is Joy. I won't even get into that. But um, my path was windy, kind of similar to everyone else's. Um, my parents divorced when I was seven and I saw them go through at a young age, the strife and struggle of trying to figure out a family and having two young kids. And we lived in New Jersey and I moved to DC with my mom as a single mom and I watched her struggle and I'm like, whew, there's got to be a better way. She was a social worker by trade and I could see, you know, she had the passion for the work that she did, but it didn't cover all the things that needed to, um, that it needed to cover. And so you know, I remember both of my parents telling me, Joy, you know, you seem like you're smart. Just so you know, we have not saved any money for you for college. So we hope you figure it out. You know, Godspeed to you. And so I heard that and, you know, worked my way through, you know, high school, et cetera. And I was able to, I'm an introvert, like an introvert's introvert. So I'm not, you know, I get all my energy from being by myself. And I surprisingly won a speech contest and I got a full ride to Penn. So that kind of took me on a path of, okay, I'm, you know, making my way doing, you know, my parents told me they didn't save. So I was able to get that cover check. I went in pre-med very quickly changed to psychology because I was follow. I, I very quickly lost the joy and the bliss, uh, you know, in, in going pre-med and, fe and felt very much as a minority. I felt like I wasn't being supported in that major, et cetera. And so I was like, okay, let me find my path. And so I graduated with a degree in psychology went to New York and for grad school, also went and got my master's in social work, did not listen to my mother. I followed my bliss. I said, this is, it is part of my blood. This is what I'm meant to do. This is what you did. I, I'm going to do it differently than you did, mom. You know, you struggled. I'm going to find a way to figure it out. So I was in New York um, and 9-11 hit uh, while I was there. And that was life-changing. It was, I was actually in the World Trade Center on September 10th. And the next day, it was a day I was supposed to be down there. And just by happenstance, I was not. And the place where I was supposed to work was two blocks from the World Trade Center, which is why I was down there the day before. Um, and so that whole placement was shut down. And so I had to rethink and figure out, oh gosh, what am I gonna do? I have no place. Part of being a social worker is being with your with people, supporting them, providing them, you know, with to support and guidance, et cetera. And I had nothing. So I had to figure out, you know, my little introverted self, I had to go and figure out, okay, where am I going to work that's going to have meaning? And so I found what's called an employee assistance program, which is basically providing counseling to people at work. And what I learned from that is everybody has stuff, everybody has issues, and most people have to work. You've got to find a living. And so I was able to meet people where they were. They're bringing their stuff. We're in the midst of 9-11. Um, and I was able to help to support people in a really important time. And then that helped me to realize my passion. Like, okay, I can, you know, maybe social work is, I will find my path with this. I moved back to the Maryland area. Um, and worked for an EAP. I was like employee number 15. We grew it to over a hundred people. It became a huge wellness program, but I felt that, and I worked very closely with human resources uh, because again, all the people are bringing their issues to work and HR is calling me, help, help us provide training, do all these sorts of things. And I enjoyed it, but I felt like I was an outsider looking in. And so trying to figure out how can I be an insider and really support and gain the trust of the people. And I got a call from a recruiter from United Therapeutics. And they said, hey, there's this company. 
It's a biotech in the middle of downtown Silver Spring. People wonder what we are. You know, is it a museum? Is it a college? It's this huge campus. Um, and it is a very special place that was founded by Martine Rothblatt. Her daughter was diagnosed with a rare disease. Um, she had originally founded Sirius Radio. She sold all her shares and started this company to, to find a cure for her daughter. And that resonated for me. I, you know, at, at the end of the day, I always want to find work is important, but I wanted to be in a place where I felt like I mattered. I felt like they were making a difference. And when I heard that story and met the people there, I was just like, I have found my home. Um, you know, I feel like it's a place where I can bring my full self. And I don't think that they're there. I, I, I think now after COVID, you know, I think we're, we're reflecting, I think a bit more than we have in the past, but I feel like prior to, to this last year and a half, there haven't been that many places where you can bring your full self to where you are. So I have felt very blessed to be able to do that. I think my husband, he um, works for a community development financial institution. He brings his full self to work. So I think we model for our children that you can be successful and do be able to do all the things and we can travel, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is to be your true authentic self and you will find success and you will find joy and you will find your bliss, but be true, to figure out who you are and find your true passion. Um, and it's been through, you know, my social work is in human resources. I meet with people every day and help them to bring the best in their organization and in their departments um, so that, you know, they, they can stay employed, et cetera. So, and, and find you know, and recruit them into a great organization um, and try to do, as I said, you know, find the joy in my children, encourage them to, to travel and see the world. Uh, you know, I'm a, I mainly grew up in DC from the age of seven on. My time is up. I hope everybody just can find their true authentic self. That is bliss. Well, me. and that's, that's what I took from you, Joy, is you have an opportunity to have your true authentic self at work. I, I'm sure there's a lot of folks on this that go to work and are providing for their families, but are feeling constrained and not being exactly what they want to be on a day-to-day -day -day basis, which is tough. So I'm hoping they get tidbits from all the speakers. So let's go back to my man, Rhett, and see if he's got his technical issues solved. Can you hear me now? Yeah, brother, we got you. All right. The technology god's finally shining on me. <laughs> go ahead, man. Um, you, know, um, you know, I do this for a living. You'd think I'd have that sorted out, but... Uh, Nonetheless, good to be with you guys tonight. Uh, bliss, man, that's an interesting word um, because I, I would define my journey sort of uh, with the word quitting. Um, and because I've quit things uh, all of my life and I'll, let me explain that. So uh, I walked into a job um, I was, it was 1999. I walked into my job at Clear Channel Communications. I was a, 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 a regional manager, walked in and quit and joined the Peace Corps. And the reason I did that is because it scared the living daylights out of me to uh, have the white pig. I, I, we had just gotten married a few years before. I was, we were going down that road of having the white picket fence, two car garage kind of life. And in a place in like Columbia, South Carolina. And, you know, I probably would have moved around in that job. And, but that scared me to death to wake up. I, I was thinking 30 or 40 years out and um, getting that gold watch, even if, even, if, even if they do that anymore. And, and that having been my life. Uh, so I just said, you know, we just, we decided, my wife and I decided, hey, we, let's do something different. You know, if we don't like it, we can, we can move on. But, you know, let's just, let's, Let's go out there. So we quit, quit that job, quit that security. We sold everything and we went to, to work in Uzbekistan in the Peace Corps. Um, we were coming to the end of the ser end of service. 9-11 happened. We got evacuated. I didn't have a plan. Um, I had met somebody from USAID who was actually happened to be the deputy director at the time. Um, while I was in Peace Corps, he came to our city. We, we got to know him. We got to, I went and visited him when I got back to Washington. He said, well, you want to go back to the region? You know, we're sending troops over there. We're, we're ramping things up. Um, 
you know, in November of that year, I was back in Central Asia because I spoke the language. I was back on the ground in Tajikistan, um, worked in the region for seven years, and then quit again to come back to the United States to start a company. Um, I had, had been thinking about it for a couple of years while I was in Central Asia uh, with AID that I wanted to do something else. Um, so I bought, and one of the things I'd wanted to do was start my own company. Uh, started a, a one toy product, product one product uh, company, toy company, children's toy company in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I bought this product from this uh, guy. I bought the concept. Uh, two years later, we were able to turn that into the toy of the year. Uh, our, our next two products were toys of the year. Uh, we ended up making about 80 products. Uh, we made products for Toys R Us, uh, Target, Walmart, uh, Science Museum, Animal Planet. Uh, about 10 years later and, and uh, in 2000, uh, or eight, nine years later in 2014, uh, 2015, I sold the company uh, because what I had realized was that I really loved to teach and I really loved the, I, I'd had a, uh, an executive coach when I was running the company. And I really, really thought that I would be good at that. I really thought I would really enjoy that and that that would be my bliss. And so I sold the toy company and I started a company called Courageous Leadership, which is I'm the co-founder of. And it's an executive coaching. So I'm an executive coach. Uh, I write uh, for Forbes and Fast Company and Inc. Magazine. I write books. I've, I've got a third book coming out this year on, on self-talk, how we talk to ourselves. Um, so the, the sort of the story there is a, a kind of at every stage in my life, I, I have listened to my gut. I've listened to what that voice inside your head says that it's time to do something different. It's time to make a pivot. It's time to follow a different path. And that drives people crazy. Um, you know, people didn't understand why I sold a company that was operating in 35 countries, why I sold a company that was uh, making money and it was very profitable to quit to do something else. But, you know, we all have that feeling. I'm sure if, if I had people raise their hands, we all understand that little voice in our head that's saying, do something different. Um, we often push it aside. We often push it away. We often, because what that little voice is telling us to do is something that, uh, that's, that's, that's hard. Uh, maybe it's, uh, quitting a job, maybe it's having a tough conversation, maybe it's, it, it's something hard, but we all know what that voice is. And, I, and I've learned to listen to it because every time I listen to it, it leads me down a path of bliss and joy and happiness. Uh, every time I don't, um, I'm miserable and I regret not listening to that inner, that inner voice. So that's to me following the bliss. When, when it's time to do something and make a change, make a move, uh, you know, I'm, uh, my wife and I now are on our, we, by the way, we live overseas. We're currently living in Brazil. I happen to be in the U.S. right now, but, um, you know, I think we're on our eighth or ninth country. Uh, Maurice, I'm not at a hundred countries yet, but I'm at, I'm at, at I think, 82. So, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's also another thing for us. We haven't lived in the U.S. in 20 years and, and we love experiencing new cultures and new places and, um, that's just part of who and what we want to be. And so I, uh, another part of that bliss for me is, and I think uh, is not being defined by your job, but, you know, and, and not being constrained by your job. Uh, we, we decide where we want to live and we figure out how we're going to make work work uh, when we figure out where we want to be. And that's how we've always conducted our life. Right. Um, and, uh, and I was really constrained by the toy company. One of the reasons we, I got out of it is because, I, I spent more time away from my family than I did with them. And so I, I needed to figure out something I could do um, via Zoom or Skype or whatever. I, I wanted to do something that allowed me to, if I wanted to go surfing during the day with my kids and, and do coaching at night, I could do that. So yeah. that's, that's our life and that's how we decide to live. And, and um, I think that, that that's sort of my bliss. And, and I think uh, one of the things I wish I could, you know, get people to see is that you don't have to be constrained by by all these things that we 
Maurice, you know, you talked about that, yeah. that, that, that path that everybody thinks you should take. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's not, uh, that's not bliss. Man. That's just not. Nope. bliss. So Rhett, um, thank you for that. And so we've, we have now met all these amazing panelists. I just want to call out something you said, Rhett, which I loved, by the way, which is, uh, I can't put it in your, your succinct words, but you have reinvented yourself over and over and over again. You, you, my friend, exude someone who knows the power of no, which to me is effectively the power of quitting, which is the power of reinventing yourself and not following the path that everyone says you have to follow. I gave up almost 80% of my salary to be a police officer. People thought I was crazy, at least in my family, but it was none of their business. I wanted to serve my local community. Um, fortunately, I got hired back at the same firm three days later. So I did both at the same time. So it all worked out, but I benefited because I was following my path. So we have now heard from these amazing eight or nine folks here. I know folks have questions. Um, let me start with this. Uh, perfect. Hey, my friend Nicole Pendergrass asked, when you live abroad so long, do you keep your US citizenship and Kaimana, I know you're back and forth, um, right? You're back, you're in Singapore right now? I am, I am in Singapore right now, uh, but I'm still a resident of Montgomery County. And I'm actually, right. I, I actually am not a resident of Singapore. I just happen to keep getting extended here longer and longer. So I think Rhett might be the best person for that one. Rhett, hit it. Do you keep yeah. your US citizenship? Are you still paying US taxes? I think a lot of folks are curious about, oh, and I'll say this. A lot of folks are really curious about the overseas lifestyle or the expat lifestyle, or maybe doing 50-50 the way that I'm doing. So I'll speak on it. What's your take on it, Rhett? Give me about a minute of how Rhett sees that part of it. I'll just put it this way. You know, my kids speak four languages. Uh, we've been to 70 something countries together. Um, they've had experiences living in some of the poorest countries in the world. So what I hope is for them is that they, they're world citizens that they have a, a different view on, on life and work and, and the world, um, which I think we need perspective and we need people like that in the world today. Um, but anyway, in, in terms of living overseas, yeah, it comes with its complexities and its, and its challenges and its frustrations, just like anything else. Um, we are U.S. citizens, we've maintained that. Um, on some years, I get the 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 eighty thousand dollar I think it's eighty thousand dollar tax exemption uh, for living overseas. Uh, but uh, some years I'm in the U.S. more with work, so I lose that. So this year, um, I will actually lose it. I'm not going to be I'm not going to be able to be exempt from the the. Uh, but we are Florida residents technically, so we don't pay a, a, a state state tax. Uh, but uh, we do live, but we do pay federal tax. I pay my U U.S. federal taxes every year because um, most of our money is actually made in the U.S. Most of our revenue, with the exception of some speaking revenue that's made in uh, different parts of the world, but most of the most of the revenue is made in the U.S. So we pay tax taxes. Awesome, awesome. And I'll just add to that: I'm I'm fifty fifty now between the U.S. and Mediterranean region, either Cyprus or Lebanon. I'm just figuring that stuff out now. What I would tell you is, who cares? Like, let's pay our taxes. Let's go live life. I don't care if I got to pay taxes, but I'm going to go do what I want to do around the world. Um, there's a question here about building a sense of community. Um, in Cyprus, one of the ways that I'm building sense of community is I'm building real estate over there because I didn't want to be the American who just shows up and goes to restaurants. I wanted to be the American who was part of the community. So that's my way of doing things. Um, let's go to uh, Miss Cheryl Chapman. Could I comment on that? Because yes, um, ma'am. My family, we have a home in Senegal, Dakar, in the village across from the embassy, looking over the ocean. And um, we have two families. We have that village. We have neighbors. We have friends. But we go there consistently every year, and we spend a, a, a significant time. My husband does particularly there. So I think it's about you finding your balance, but we pay because our retirement and all of our benefits, we pay U.S. taxes. Incredible. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm, 
back to Miss Katie, if you're there. I see you now, okay. Um, it resonated with me what you said before versus passion, passion work versus work work. I think the holy grail is when your passion actually pays for your, for your life and you don't necessarily have to do the work work aspect of it. If you could just comment on the, the challenges of having these two different um, work streams and how you balance it. <laughs> balance is a good word because it's very busy. And it's a lot of um, tracking my time and making sure that uh, I can do everything. I like to be very organized. So um, I try to build in time for me. So one of my new passions that's been a huge source of bliss is I'm a gardener because of the pandemic. So being stuck at home last year, I just discovered the joy of gardening. So it's like having that in my life now makes makes it like I have a reason to create balance because I see that when I get overwhelmed with too many things going on, then I, I can't function. And then if I can't show up to whatever I have to do, then nobody's gonna really benefit. So it's really important to just be able to stay organized and to be able to um, have the energy to show up with what you need to do and have flexibility. I'm very fortunate that my job lets me kind of choose my schedule. But now I'm I'm running into um, everybody wants a drum circle right now. So <laughs> it's just crazy. It's crazy. So really, we need more drum circle facilitators. But I'm getting so many requests. And I, you know what? Talk to me in a month, Maurice, and I'll tell you how there I'm you doing. <laughs> it's worth it. And people it need you. So do whatever you got to do to balance that stuff. David, I have a question for you that I think will resonate with a lot of people. People are just nervous about starting their passion, like Katie, starting the business. Um, if it's a brick and mortar business like you do, how do I do it? Where do I do it? What gave you the guts to go after that type of effort? And what advice could you give anyone out here who wants to start something brand new and potentially potentially get away from you know the nine to five that they've been doing in their own lives yeah that's a, a great question and um not an easy answer i'd say the answer comes back to what we have actually already spoken about that if it's something that you love and a passion and uh something you have to do uh then you just you And running it, there is nothing easy about running a, a brick and mortar spot. Um, nothing easy about it, and so many little things to manage and deal with. And um, it's uh, it's very hard. Hey, David, you're you're coming in and out again with the with okay. the, the headphones. Now I got you again. Okay. Hear me now. Yep. Okay. I think you're better without the headphones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, sorry, I was just going to um, continue to add, if, if anybody would like to talk about the ins and outs of a brick and mortar um, operation, I'll leave my email here and anybody can hit me up. But, um, you know, just to be really real, it's, uh, it's really hard. Um, like anything, you need to build a, a good team, um, empower other people, um, trust other people. Um, and it all comes down to uh, doing whatever it takes to to keep your dream alive and, and make it work. Love it. Yeah, lots of lots of different things to to tackle and deal with. It's a it's a it's a lot of different things to tackle and deal with. I touched on thanks, David. I touched on freedom principles at the beginning, and yeah. one of them was freedom of purpose. <laughs> I think when you have purpose behind what you want to do, work is it's easy to do the work, or you're willing to put in the work. If, if it's just money, that, that runs out at some point. And that's where we get into the matrix and we're pressing repeat. If there's purpose behind it and it's purpose driven, it's a lot easier. So Laurie asked a question about creating time. You are absolutely right, Laurie. I definitely create time for stuff. Uh, I get it from my military sense, but how in the world was I a full-time full -time executive, federal agent and police officer, entrepreneur all at the same time? I create time. I am the 4 a.m. guy, 
the guy that everyone talks about and stuff. 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. I, I would hustle. And then 7 p.m. to 9, 9 p.m. I would hustle. Um, nowadays, it's 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. That's four hours, four extra hours a day, 20 hours a week, 80 hours a month, 960 hours a year. That's an extra five to six weeks of time. I'm willing to do it, um, if, not, if not more. Um, I think if we want anything and we still have to go do the hustle like Katie and have our job, then we got to create other times so we can have a passion like David and Kaimana to get after our shops and what have you. Um, so I'm going to pose the same question to Ms. Joy Carr. Joy, you are handling a lot for the, the goodness, the therapeutics folks down in Silver Spring. By the way, I know Tommy Kaufman. I don't know if he's still there. Yes. Yeah. That's my guy right there. I love that dude. Yeah. Now, I feel bad. I'm going to give him a call. But how do you manage all the needs of all those folks? I know you have a passion for helping people. Um, how do you manage it all um, for your role there? That is a good question. <laughs> um, you were inspiring me with kind of creating that extra time. Um, I think it's through communication. I think it's knowing that I'm going to be able to get done what I can. And I, you know, work hard and, you know, put in the extra hours. But I think at the end of the day, knowing that I can only do so much and letting people know, hey, this is what I can do. This is when I can do it. And so that people know and setting that expectation, um, you know, that's what I have to, that's, that's just what I have to do. And I think what someone else said in terms of making sure that I'm filling my bucket, I think it was Katie and ensuring that I am able to bring my full self um, and making sure that I take the time to take care of myself, spend time with my family, which are the things that are important so that I have something to give to the folks at, at UT and, you know, plus the, the joy of just the work, I think, I think helps as well but no, no magic pill there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, UT, that's right. United Therapeutics, man, I was missing the, the first, the first. I'm going to tell Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't tell him. Don't tell him, please. Hey, Ariana, um, I don't know if we have any, let me see if I have any other questions in, oh, I see one. That's a great one. Um, Ariana, with what you do, um, it storytelling is a very unique skill and there's a great question here how do you hold on i just lost the question and i had it failure. How do you overcome the fear you know fear of failure and backlash and obviously yours is a non-traditional i mean in the normal society sense right but not in your sense i love what you do yours is kind of non-traditional from society perspective how do you get over the fear of failure and how did you how did you get to your success level for storytelling? So I really relate to, to Joy's comment about being an introvert because I, time for myself. Um, so I literally, I, I am an introvert who is forced to be an extrovert for my job. Um, and so I, I actually like, I love telling stories, but I'm not someone who like automatically gets on stage in front of 10,000 people. Um, so what I do oftentimes is just quietly journal, draw, um, vision maps, I think are really, really important. I thoroughly believe that the fear of failure is overcome by speaking something into existence. Um, so I really will often be like, today, I'm going to find a sponsor for this. Today, I'm going to manage this. And part of my job, besides being a storyteller, is being an executive director, which is what I say is like taking storytelling to a whole nother level, except I have to tell the organization story and the community story. Um, so I do a lot. I'm, I just moved. So the reason um, I have this up is so that nobody sees my boxes. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to putting up my, my vision journals. Um, and then the other thing about backlash is that something um, a dear friend of mine and a mentor, Dwight Conkerbund once said is, nobody has the right to create your narrative but yourself. No one has the right to take away what you are capable of. So the fear of backlash is someone else taking over your story. Um, so I constantly remind myself that this is my story and I'm doing my best to follow my path. And sometimes my path takes an entirely, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a leadership Montgomery graduate, but I'm not gonna lie, when I applied, I did it kicking and screaming. My board wanted me to do it. They were like, you should do this. And I was like, uh -huh, uh -huh, I don't want to. That requires energy. And now that I've done it, 
I'm like, oh my God, these people are amazing. I'm so glad. Even during our, our nickname is quarantine. So what I would say is failure and backlash, just remember that you are the most amazing human and that no one else can tell you otherwise. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Ariana. And, and you know what resonated with me there? Um, you gave, so I like practical, right? I like practical advice and pie in the sky is good, but how can we help folks here right now? And one of the things you said was, I think it was a vision board or, or um, what did you say? You said you either said a vision board or something else. I call it a vision map for me. Vision so map. I will draw more, but I, vision map. Like I literally, yeah. how am I getting out there? But I don't write it out. Yeah. I draw it out. I'm not a visual artist. So it's like stick figures. There you go. Okay. But that's a tool, right? Like a vision board, a vision map, whatever you want to call it, is something that will drive us towards our, our future. I think that's a great thing. I'm wondering, uh, I don't know if we still have Romton. Is Romton still there? I think we've lost Romton. Okay. Um, uh, let's see who I have. Um, Kaimana. Kaimana, I am wondering if there's any particular advice tool methodology that you've used to shift between those multiple careers and to get to this level of um, entrepre entrepreneurial excellence is what I'll call it in your restaurant industry. Is there anything that you can advise the rest of us? Yeah, I think it goes back to the question that was uh, answered earlier about not being afraid to fail. I, I read a quote and I don't know where it's from, but it, it said that, um, what would you do uh, if you knew you would not fail, right? And that question resonated. If, if you were guaranteed not to fail, what would you do? And I, unfortunately, my uh, unfortunately, my, my drive and passion comes from, um, from a lot of adversity and loss. My, my mom died at 17 years old um, and I was two and a half years old. And then later my sister uh, passed away and she was 24. And so my drive comes a lot from feeling responsible, right? To, to take advantage of every opportunity that they didn't have in their young lives. Um, since then, I, I've lost a best friend to cancer and my aunt who was like my second mom also, also died to cancer. And I, I think that those um, pivotal moments in my life reaffirm that you have to take chances. You have to take chances. Uh, and those events in my life have driven me to say, if not for myself, I need to do it for those people that I love and I feel them carrying me through. So uh, while not everybody goes through that kind of loss or, or several times in their lives, I think that my philosophy now really is to, and it sounds cliche, but basically take advantage of every opportunity, live life to its fullest. And failure is, is learning, right? When we fail, we learn and we become better and we make better choices. Uh, so this no fear attitude of mine comes as a gift through adversity from losing so many people in my life that were very, very close to me. Um, on, the, on the physical side, I think having a restaurant, and I, I forgot to say that I, the reason why I met Lisa is because I do run on a Hawaiian cultural school in Silver Spring and I teach Hawaiian music, language, dance, and culture. Culture, music, and food are the three passions of my life. And I found a way to turn all of that into a way to make a living. And I think that is my bliss. But my, my message would be is, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Failure is learning. I love it, Kaimana. I love it, my man. Thank you. And I could see the, the kind of the, the, the emotion that was probably coming up behind you in that. Um, dude, you have a passion for what you do. So it's going to be easy to get after it. One thing that when Kaimana was speaking, it reminded me that when I was in Costa Rica, when I was 33, I went to a retirement conference to figure out what retirement meant. I was 15 years junior to everybody there. This thing that everyone tells us about retirement, I was confused. I met a gentleman entrepreneur by the name of Gil. He and I hit it off and he gave me a piece of paper that had your life in days. And it said, if, you, if we live to 79 and everything else is gravy, let's just say we're only gonna live to 79, we have 28,000 days to live. I means I'm 45, I have roughly 8,000 days left. I look at the number of days because it makes me very intentional about what I do, where I do it, and how I do it. So when Kamana is talking about just go after what it is you wanna do, just fall forward and get after it, that really resonates with me. 
So come on, I really, excuse me, I really appreciate that. Um, Ms. Chapman or Dr. Chapman, I'm wondering if there's any thoughts you could express to the group about uh, your younger self, like what, what it, now having been through all the experiences you've been through and being that triad of an amazing woman that you talked about and which I can feel, what advice would you give to your younger self now knowing uh, what the world is like and, and your journey through it? Well, I think I try to put it in the chat room because I know our time is winding down. I, I wish I had been more cognizant of the fact that we always have a choice. I felt that I was making choices out of a reality that I had no control of. And so I wish that I did not have the side effect of, of being worried or concerned about things I did do anyway because it was blissful, so I did it. But I was always worried about how other people would perceive me, how other people would relate to me, what other people who would accuse me of not caring about what they want in a situation. I wish I had been more self-aware that the choices that you make result in consequences that you must own. And these other folk aren't even in the discussion. I wish I was clear about that because I would have been even more expedient in my journey around the world and do what I want to do. Yep. Dr. Chapman, I love that. You are an inspiration. And it just reminds me that I don't care what people think. I really don't. Uh, you should care about what you think and what is good for your life because we have this one journey. I am unapologetically me. My boy Bellman's on the line. He would be the first one to, to um, validate that. Who I am is who I am. Who all of you are is who all of you are. So you have to get after what it is that makes sense for you. All right, we're starting to wrap up. It is getting close to 8.30. Um, let me just jump over to Ms. Carr real quick. Ms. Carr, is there anything that you would tell your younger self now being in the position where you are now? And then I'll start to wrap up and I will go to every panelist. So please do not leave me panelists. I'm coming to you. I would say, do you. People are not paying attention. They don't care what you're doing. Focus on yourself, focus on your dreams. Do you. I love it. I love it. And actually let's, let's stick with that. Let's stick with that theme as we wrap up and then I'll share a few final thoughts um, with practical things that I want to give y'all. But let's talk to younger selves a little bit. David, younger self, what, it, what was it that you, you would give? Um, sorry, I was just distracted by my kids. Um, I would say that um, I would tell my younger self to, yeah, exactly what Joy said. That there's, there's nothing more to it. Just keep finding out who you are, recognize that who you are also changes, and that's okay too. And um, that's part of the evolution. And that that's not going to end either. And that's accepting life, loving life, enjoying the journey, and following the path that... Uh, you seek and, and you know within yourself. I love it. I love it. And Ariana, I saw you um, clapping those, or uh, snapping those fingers, I think is what she was doing right there. So why don't you add on to that? And if you have any other additional parting thoughts, just hit the group with it. I was going to say for me, yes and. Yes and to everything that was said. And then also listen. Um, I think the biggest gift that I've gotten now as an adult is spending time with um, elders in the community and really listening to their stories and then listening to their journeys and listening to their path, as well as listening to the path of those younger than me. So don't forget that half of what you know is what you hear. Um, and then paying attention to body language. When I was a kid, I had <clears throat> no um, personal space um, and <laughs> had to learn that as an adult. But just like really listen to people's voice and words as much as what they're telling you through their body. I think that's the hardest um, shift right now is that kids feel like they don't know how to behave with other people physically. I'm seeing that a lot because of COVID, because of the pandemic. And even adults are like, do I hug? Do I touch? Do I step back? Do I? And I feel like I'd also just tell my younger self, like, take a deep breath. You'll fi figure it out. Awesome. Awesome. Miss Katie. One last, one last parting shot for the crew. If you have any uh, other tidbits you just want to throw out there. 
Uh, it's, it's also super important to listen to yourself, to learn how to give yourself that time and space to check in and listen to what your own guidance is and really develop that. If you can develop that at a young age and bring that through your whole life, it is such a guide and, a, and it, it's going to navigate you through tough waters when you can't see which way to go. But if you know that, that quiet voice within, it's going to be so important. And also pay attention to what brings you joy and follow that. And pay attention to who shows up in your life to be your guides. I got here because I saw other people doing it. And I said, okay, and it was just like one person led to another, and here I am. And now I am that person for you and so many others. I love it. Thank you, Katie. And all right, I'm going to start to wrap us up. I want to tell you guys something. Um, I'm going to go back to those freedom principles that I talked about. Financial freedom, time freedom, geographic freedom. A lot of us talk, uh, talked about uh, touching other places. Freedom of purpose. It's much easier to do all this stuff when, it, when it's purposeful. The, the one that I like to touch on is freedom of relationships. When we stop meeting new people, when we stop uh, reaching out to people who know more than us about things to include life itself, I think we stop growing. Um, that can be anything from amazing Silver Spring Town Center, uh, Zoom chats like my girl Lisa put on for us today. She didn't have to do this. We are literally trying to expose ourselves to different things, right? Now I know Joy works down at UT. I'm gonna go down there and have some lunch and have a conversation. But I just wanna highlight for everything that I've done, I know I hit a, a long list at the beginning. That's okay. I, I'm a Haitian immigrant kid. I did not expect, I expected to play in the NFL. And when I didn't make it to the NFL at my tryout, then I was like, all right, I'm a course correct. Uh, I'm gonna do consulting, that worked. I did not expect to be, um, uh, real estate investment guy, but I am now, I got a mentor to do it. I went after relationships. What I'm doing now in the Mediterranean and building property out there is only because purpose, I wanted legacy for my family. There's no one in my Haitian family that owns property on the island of Cyprus. There is one now. I didn't know how to do it. I found a, a guy who has been the, the husband of someone I graduated in college I just kept seeking someone who had done something that I didn't do before. So I am now uh, doing real estate development in the Mediterranean because I found someone else who did it and I'm just learning. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I am doing it. Um, relationships, they matter. You just heard all these folks on this call, um, unique backgrounds, amazing stories, find them, grab their names, go to Lisa's flyer, Network with each other. I don't even like networking because networking is for like a purpose. Relationships are for bonding with each other and living life together and learning skills and all those types of things. I think that's really important to finding your bliss. We are not intended to be on this planet by ourselves. We are intended to be connected to each other. So I really want to thank the 45, almost 50 or 60 people that joined this call to get connected and learn something new. Lisa, I appreciate you asking me to moderate. I'm glad I got back from overseas in time. I am happy to be a Montgomery County resident. If you live in Montgomery County, it has been my pleasure to be a police officer for you for the past 15 years. I am going to miss it. Um, but Lisa, thank you for doing this. And for those of you who are on the panel, I'm just stunned by the diversity of what exists around here. And it just makes me happy to be connected to all of you. So I appreciate it. And Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Maurice. Yes, we live in such a, a rich community. It's so diverse with so many talented folks. And I am the luckiest person on earth because I get to work with all of you in some ways, in very creative ways, you know, just come up with an idea, let's put this together and we get to we get to do it and have important discussions such as this, inspiring words from each of you. Thank you so much to Katie, David, um, Dr. Chapman, uh, Joy, um, and Ariana, Ramteen. Um, we had so many. We had so many panelists. That Brett Power was on. Um, it was such a wonderful conversation that can branch off in so many different directions, and that's what we're about. You know, that's what SSTCI is about. Is about 
really sharing not only connecting people creatively, making creative connections and engaging people, but also ideas, you know, fresh ideas and learning from each other. And we're, I'm just very blessed to be able to work with all of you. And thank you so much to all of our audience too, as well as our panelists. And Maurice, again, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I'd be very upset if I don't see new friend requests on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. <laughs> I'd be super upset. But I really appreciate it, Lisa. It's my, been my pleasure. Thank you. It was awesome, Maurice. Thank you to everyone. Bye, guys. Thank you. Oh, there's your little guy. <laughs> See ya. Thank you.